Good morning. Thank you to the General President for those very kind words. I'm from Australia, and that's why I'm not wearing a tie. That's why I don't own a tie. <laughs> I was explaining to Pat earlier, I had to look very hard to find a pair of long pants to wear. But this is the price you pay if you're going to invite an Australian to come and talk to you all. Now, in Australia, I am a psychologist, and for about 20 years, I've been working with our fire departments. And the psychological health of firefighters is something that's very important to me. So it really was a great honour uh, to be invited here to talk to you. I've been asked to talk about post-traumatic stress. and I've been given about 40 minutes to do so. But before I uh, give my talk, I just want to say one thing. And I do want to congratulate the IAF for its amazing work on the whole behavioural health issue. I work in military agencies and civilian agencies and first responder agencies around the world. But when I look at what your organisation is doing in the behavioural health sphere, you really should be proud of what you are doing. It really is ahead of the game. It's adapted with the knowledge that we've accrued over the last 20 years. So many agencies have stayed where they were 20 years ago but your organisation is learning and actually leading where first responders are heading in the future in this, in this space. And that really is something that I think you should be proud of. Now, what I would like to talk about today, because I do understand that many of you probably don't know a lot about post-traumatic stress, and it's an awful lot to cover. And I want to make this relevant. So I thought I would just talk to you a little bit about what it is that we mean by post-traumatic stress. I think it's important that you understand what we understand, what causes it. How is it different in a firefighter? What do we know now about the course of it, PTSD, the trajectory or its, its nature over time? And then most importantly, how can we possibly prevent it and treat it? And one of the points I want to finish on, which I think is very important, is what is the role of managers and of the organisation, rather than just the individual, in actually dealing with this issue? Now, post-traumatic stress, to be honest, has been known for about a century. If you want to look at the history books from the First World War, that's when this issue really became big, in the, in the trench war warfare on the Western Front. It was horrendous what troops went through. And to be honest, in the following 100 years, so much attention has been given to this, to at this topic at time of war. Then between the wars, we tend to forget it. But in the 1980s, in the US, finally, the field of psychiatry really had to deal with troops coming back from Vietnam. And so that's when the construct of post-traumatic stress became formally recognised. And it became recognised as essentially a persistent anxiety or fear problem that persisted when you've been exposed to something very, very traumatic. And it, the definition has gone through changes over time. And in a couple of years ago, 2013, we actually had the latest edition of, of how we define it. And it is, as you see up on the screens there, there's a number of clusters or criteria one has to meet to formally meet the diagnosis. And that's what your insurers are looking at. And the first thing is you need to be exposed or you need to witness something really, really traumatic, something that's going to threaten my own well-being, my safety, or somebody else's safety. Then we have a range of symptoms that people will experience. And the first one, and to be honest, this is probably the core one, it's, it's the memories of the trauma. And when we talk to somebody with post-traumatic stress, they're not just thinking about something bad that happened in the past. These memories are being relived. So if you're talking to a firefighter who's got post-traumatic stress, it's not that the person is just thinking about that really bad event I went to, but they would probably be having very perceptually real memories. They may actually smell the smoke. They may actually feel the flames burning against their skin. They may actually literally be hearing a baby crying. Now, these are perceptually very rich 
memories that come with enormous distress. And they can also come in the form of uh, nightmares or what we call flashbacks, where the person actually believes they're back in that situation again. Now, the amount of distress this, this causes then leads the person to then avoid any reminders they have. People with post-traumatic stress effortfully will avoid uh, anything that might bring back those memories. And to be honest, in firefighters, one of the most common forms of avoidance is alcohol abuse. Because the more that I can just get numb, then the less those memories possibly may be coming at me. Now, in the latest edition of um, our, our diagnosis, there was a, something new brought in that was quite radical and a bit controversial. And one of the major reasons this new group of symptoms was brought in was partly because of the military, um, of events coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, but also out of first responders. And it was, a, it was really that took PTSD beyond the level of fear, because it's always been considered a fear and anxiety problem. But increasingly, people began to see that a lot of people with PTSD also had problems just with very low mood, with anger, with guilt, with shame, and also just with persistent, very negative appraisals about themselves and about their world. Now, these things are not encompassed in a normal fear model, but these are very real um, to the military and to first responders. And then the last group of symptoms, if you like, are a heightened arousal. And by that, I mean it's where the person, their whole um, fight and flight response system is constantly in alert mode. I'm constantly on the lookout for danger. So I will be uh, constantly um, on edge. I'll be very jumpy. I won't be sleeping. I'll be really angry. I'll be losing my temper a lot. I'm going to have trouble concentrating. I may even be engaging in, in very reckless behaviour. Now, what do we know about how common um, PTSD is in firefighters? Now, this is a contentious issue because, to be honest, in first responders generally, getting a good grip on how common it is is hard because people tend to under-report. Now, if we look across the world, across many, many studies, if you just look at the national rates in any population, it tends to be about 4% of a population will have PTSD. If we look at first responders, and by that I mean police, firefighters, paramedics, etc., it tends to be at least 10%. Now, that's probably an uh, under-reporting. So it's safe to say that in firefighters, probably the likelihood of having PTSD is between two and a half, three times greater than if you're not a firefighter. And when you're saying that at least one in 10 of people in your organisation has this problem, that is a significant organisational issue. That is something that any, any, any union, any employer needs to take serious you know, account of, because that's also a major threat to productivity, operational efficiency, etc. Now, I would like to speak a bit about what do we know about what causes PTSD. Now, bear with me here. This is not the sort of uh, uh, lecture you were probably expecting this morning, but a lot of what we know about PTSD actually comes from other species, because fear is not something that's unique to humans. And what we've learned so much about in terms of PTSD, most of it, actually comes from very basic science. And I want to explain a little bit about this because it's actually very relevant to what I want to talk about with firefighters. What essentially happens across species whenever we get exposed to a trauma is essentially this. And this is the sort of experiment that, we, that would normally be happening in a laboratory. And this has happened in thousands of experiments. We would normally put a rat into a chamber. Now, I know a rat is not a firefighter. I know you're probably thinking, I know some firefighters who might be rats, but let's not go there, all right? <laughs> but in this sort of study, we would put a rat into a chamber, and we would give it an electric shock. And at the same time as we give it an electric shock, a little light is going to come on in that chamber. Now, at that moment, something really important happens in that rat's brain. There's a part of its brain, a very primitive part, it learns that that light is no longer just a light. 
That light is actually signalling danger because it happened at the same time as it got shocked. Now what that means is the next time we put that rat back in the chamber, but we don't shock it, we just turn the light on, it instantly has all the fear reactions that we as humans normally have. Why? Because that light is telling us it's about to get hurt again. Now, what's this got to do with PTSD? Essentially, if we actually take the parallel with a firefighter, rather than the, elect the electric shock that we initially gave the rat, that's like the firefighter getting exposed to something really, really traumatic. And all of the things that are going on um, at that time for that firefighter, that's like the light going off. Now, in the following days, weeks, months, and even years later, a firefighter with um, PTSD, they might not have lights coming on, but the things that were present at the time of that traumatic event can bring back all the fear. So it might be something very benign. It might be the smell of burnt steak on a barbecue. It might be the sound of a siren in the distance. It might be the scream of their baby. Anything at all that was there at the time of that traumatic event, that then brings it all back because they think it's happening again. And that's essentially what PTSD is. Now, in essence, this is not a maladaptive in its own right. This is actually a survival mechanism that we all have. And essentially the way our brains operate is that we are hardwired to detect threats to our well-being. We have to so we can learn not to get in that situation again. If I'm walking in a forest and I see a snake, automatically my brain is going to detect that threat. It's hardwired to this small part of the brain called the amygdala that's going to um, release the fear responses, the fight and flight response that tells me to either you know, get, get the hell out of there or to take some other sort of um, protective action. And believe me, I come from Australia where we have most of the world's dangerous snakes. So when we see a snake, we know we've got to, you know, it's out to kill us. Now, the good news about this is that for most of us, when we actually go through this sort of situation, if you go back to this rat, if we keep throwing, turning that light on in the rat, for the rat, but we don't shock it anymore, but we just keep turning that light on, then what's happening is there is new learning going on in the brain. And essentially, new learning is teaching that rat that the light's no longer scary. There's nothing more to be afraid of. It's teaching it that it's actually OK now. And so for most firefighters who get exposed to a traumatic event, most people will actually have post-traumatic reactions in the first days. That's not a problem. That's actually normal for most of us. That's healthy. If it persists over time, then it becomes problematic because what will happen for most firefighters is as they then hear the sirens, smell the burnt steak on the barbecue, hear the crying baby, but nothing bad is happening to them, then over and over and over, the brain is subtly learning these things aren't a threat anymore. Life is okay, I am safe. The people I love, the people around me are safe. And so for most people, they then adapt. And that is why we only end up with about one in 10 people actually developing this problem. Most of us are able, we've got the, the brain working in such a way that we're able to learn that actually we're safe again. So in essence, what PTSD is, is I still believe the threat is there. Now, I do want to make a point that when we're talking about PTSD and firefighters, let's not just talk about fear and anxiety. This is a problem I think we all often fall into. It, PTSD rarely happens alone. It will nearly always happen with other problems, and the big ones are depression, in firefighters, alcohol abuse is huge. Suicide is a major one. Anger and interpersonal difficulties. Relationship breakdowns, etc. These are massive problems and we do need to recognise that just dealing with the PTSD, often then there will be a benefit in these other problems, but not always. And we need to keep that in mind. We've also got to be aware that in firefighters, 
It's not like somebody else who's in a bad car accident or gets assaulted. Firefighters are repeatedly exposed. It's like police, paramedics, etc. You just don't have a single event. You're going to get exposed and exposed and exposed. And if you go back to that animal model of PTSD, that's like shocking the rat time and time again. Now, this is a really complicating issue because it means that we are then putting the person in harm's way and that the likelihood of developing post-traumatic stress is actually likely to be uh, increased. But the other point we've really got to make here that's often forgotten is there's been a lot of studies done on post-traumatic stress in firefighters and other first responders. And what these studies tell us is if you try to understand what is accounting for most of the post-traumatic stress, it's actually not traumatic events or critical incidents. It's actually organisational stress. That's actually the major driver of why this is continuing. And sometimes this is just bad management, you know, having a really uh, unhealthy boss. But very often it's just the nature of the job. It just might be the shift work, the lack of promotion, budget cuts, you know the drill. These are factors that just often contribute to the compounding stress. And clearly, a lot of these things will then impact on, on factors outside the job, on family predominantly, which then feeds back into it. So we just can't put this all on a traumatic event. It would be simple if we could, but it's actually more complicated than that. I also wanted to make a point about a new, relatively new concept that's been talked about in the last few years that's getting a lot of traction with first responders. And this is the issue of moral injury. Now, moral injury has actually been known for many, many years, but it's actually become a lot more popular since the Afghanistan-Iraq wars. And the military's taken this concept up with gusto because of the many issues it had um, with the problems of troops uh, mistakenly killing innocent civilians or not being able to save uh, comrades in, in the context of IEDs and sniper attacks, etc. And essentially what moral injury involves is not a fear response, but rather it's a sense of guilt or shame. Now, we do see in my clinic a lot of firefighters and other first responders who have this sort of guilt or shame because they feel that they have not done enough in protecting um, civilians, saving their lives, or sometimes not even protecting their buddies. I mean, some examples. I was, I was, years ago, I was in, working with a fire service, and we had some massive wildfires in Australia. And I was up in a chopper, and um, we got word that there was a firefighter who was then split off from his unit, and the fire was coming in, and it was going to um, surround him. And so the only chance of getting him out was for this chopper to land and get him out. Now, this chopper pilot um, tried repeatedly to land to get this guy out, but the, the winds at the time were phenomenal, gale force winds. He tried numerous times, and he realised he just had to finally abort the mission because he would have killed all of us if he'd actually... Um, gone in. We were nearly blown against a cliff face a few times. Now, when we landed, this, this poor guy was absolutely beating himself up by the fact that he could not save this guy's life. Did everything humanly possible. I mean, he was a decorated great pilot, but there was nothing anybody could have done. That didn't matter. He believed he should have been able to do it. Or take the case of another firefighter who driving at speed to a, to a fire, um, driving the, the fire truck, but there's some kids playing football um, on the side of the road. Kid runs out um, to get the ball that's got onto the road straight in the, in the way of the truck, and uh, he, he kills the kid. He did nothing wrong. It was just bad luck. But he felt terrible, Understandably, he felt personally responsible that somehow there's sort of been something he should have done. Now, these are not fear reactions. These do not come under the normal umbrella of post-traumatic stress, but these are increasingly recognised as real issues that first responders need to deal with because underlying it 
a lot of first responders do believe that their job is to, is to protect other people. But there is a limit to what we can do. But sometimes that, that belief gets challenged. Now, what do we know about the course of PTSD? How does it change over time? Now, if I was giving you this talk a decade ago, this is sort of the, the graph I would show you. I would show you a graph where most people have got post-traumatic stress in the first week, maybe, and then over time it gradually gets better. But like nearly everything else I talked about 10 years ago, it's wrong. Um, that's a problem with my field, it just keeps changing ridiculously. This is a study we did recently, over a thousand people, where we followed them um, for uh, over a couple of years. And these weren't firefighters, but what it essentially told us was that when we assess people at different points, the incidence of PTSD and what we called also subsyndromal PTSD, that is PTSD, but you didn't quite meet the full criteria, it was sort of halfway to PTSD. The incidence of it stayed the same at each time point, but who the people were at each time point, they were all, half of them were different. Everyone kept moving from category to category. You know, at six months, I might have, three months, I might have PTSD, and then at 12 months, I might be fine. And then another year later, I might be back to having PTSD again. Bottom line is, this is not a static problem. It is dynamic, it fluctuates. And this is something that my field is just waking up to very belatedly, that we cannot see that if you see a person at a point of time, don't expect that's going to be how the person's going to be later on. And what is the big predictor of how I'm changing over time? Well, it's a no-brainer. Basically, it's, it's just a life. You know, it's whatever else is going on as time goes on. Now, it may be your job, it may be you know, other critical incidents you've been through. It may, be, it may be crap that you're dealing with in the workplace. Or it just may be what stuff that's going on at home. It may be my marriage is having problems. It may be my kids are on drugs. I mean, it could be all sorts of problems. But whatever life stresses are going on, that is going to impact on sort of where I am on my course of post-traumatic stress. Now, this means that we've actually now started to take a little bit of a more sophisticated approach, and I won't try and explain the statistical modeling to you, but there's now about a dozen studies in the literature with all different sorts of populations, including military, that tell us that by and large, there are some set trajectories that people do follow. And let me just sort of highlight that what they tell us now is that about three quarters of people are basically gonna be resilient. They're gonna be fine the whole way through. And there's going to be a small proportion of people, and after exposure, exposure to a traumatic event, they're going to be highly distressed, and they're going to stay that way until they get treatment. There'll be another small group who will look like they're initially distressed, and then they will gradually get better over time. And then there'll be another group that looks sort of okay at the beginning, and they'll gradually get worse over time. And essentially what this means is that we can't expect how a person is looking just after an event to be a true indicator of how they're going to be later on. And I'll talk about the implications for that in terms of management in a, in a bit. Now, what do we know about the risk factors? I've said that only about one in 10 people are gonna develop PTSD, so how come? Well, Bottom line is we know that genetics accounts for a lot of it. We know that psychiatric history accounts for a lot of it, childhood trauma. We know that if you're female, you're twice as likely to develop PTSD. Um, we know that in terms of the trauma itself, the severity and the multitude of trauma exposures, there's a, there's a very clear dosage effect. The more that I'm exposed to and the more in my face and the more personal it is, that really increases the risk the more of the perceived threat, the more that, it, that I see it as traumatic rather than it just objectively being traumatic is a big risk factor. And what's the important point here? It's not just the event, it's the, it's the spin that I put on it. It's the interpretation. And in the aftermath of it, we know that the two big predictors are social support, 
And it's both negative and positive. It's not just having good buddies around me and good family, but also we know that having bad social networks. Like if I'm in a bad relationship, that's going to be a big predictor of me having even a worse outcome. But also ongoing stresses, ongoing threats. Now, a problem with so much of the risk factor work is that it's all collected, this is data collected after we, um, you know, the person develops PTSD. Let me take a minute and explain to you a study we did about 10 years ago now of a prospective study with firefighters. And this is where we were working with fire chiefs in Sydney. And we actually uh, worked with a whole cohort of new uh, recruits. Um, they were doing cadet training. And they came into my university and we, we did a whole workup on them. And then what we were able to do is as we had access to their database, we could then bring them back within a month of being exposed to a trauma, then six months, and then also four years later. So we could actually get a true um, prospective study of risk factors. So we assessed them in our lab on a whole bunch of things, and they all went out, worked a lot, got exposed to a lot of different jobs. And let me just tell you about a few of our results. In one of the studies, we did a, what we called a startle paradigm. And all it means is that we just hit the, the cadet with really loud white noise. Basically, it's just startling the hell out of them because this is basically an essential measure of my reactivity to threat. And when we looked at their acute stress, their post-traumatic stress in the first month, we found that it was partially predicted by just how reactive they are. And this is reactive in terms of measuring their skin conductance response, um, which is a very basic physiological measurement of reactivity to threat. We could predict how likely it is by, by that, um, the level of that prior to their ever getting joining a, a firehouse. Another paradigm we did was similar to the one I spoke earlier about with the rats. Now obviously we don't get big firefighters and stick them into a little chamber, but it's a bit similar. We put them in front of a computer screen and we show them different shapes. And with some shapes we give them an electric shock and with other ones we don't. <laughs> this, believe it or not, is a very standard psychology experiment. Very f funny story, though, about doing this study, because um, there's very strict ethics about this. You know, you've got institutional review boards and everything, and the way it works is that you've actually got to get the participant to sort of set their own level as to how far you can shock them. Now, when I was talking to the main fire chief who was running the, 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 the cadet school, I explained it to him, and he said, look, don't you worry about it. These guys have to learn to be tough. You can shock them as hard as you like. Don't give them any choice. Um, and it was really good because I had this really good-looking female psychologist running the experiments, and she was sort of saying to all of them, she said, look, all the other guys can do it much, much higher than this. Don't you want to go it higher? And nobody would put a lemon on it. So these, th these guys literally had steam coming out of their ears. It's like, you know, we're shocking them. But that actually led to a really, really good experiment because what we then did was after we did this, we then kept showing them the shapes but no longer shocking them because that's the safety learning, right? That's what I was talking about l earlier. That's when the, the, how quickly I can learn this new um, uh, capacity that I'm, I'm safe again. And essentially, when we um, follow these people up, four years later, what we found was, in terms of their post-traumatic stress, so much of it was explained by how impaired they were in learning safety at a neural level prior to actually ever um, starting service. And this is just an individual difference. Now, we just didn't look at biological factors. We also looked at just how people think, because we know this is a huge factor. Some people think gloom and doom. Some people don't. And what we um, assessed the firefighters on was just how likely they were to think very negatively about themselves and about, about, about the world, how much they were to blame themselves for things. And what we found at six months, and at four years later, was that I'm more likely to develop post-traumatic stress if I come into the, the service actually being that sort of person who actually blames himself and thinks poorly of themselves if they can't do all the things that they expect of themselves. Now, what does all this mean? It tells us that some, peop some firefighters begin their careers being more at risk than others. Okay, that's stating the obvious. 
but you're more at risk if you're prone to this more exaggerated fear response, you've got difficulties in just learning safety, and do you have a tendency to think very unrealistically about yourself in a negative way? Now, I often get asked at this point by military and first responder agencies, well, given this knowledge, do you guys um, have the capacity to screen firefighters or anybody to work out who's actually then we should be taking in? And let me just say the short answer is we don't. Yeah, we've under identified these patterns, these mechanisms, but that does not translate to being able to sensitively screen people on these factors. Because if we tried to do this, I can guarantee you, we would be rejecting a hell of a lot of great firefighters, and we would probably be taking in others, you know, who probably aren't going to travel that well. But it does raise another issue, and that is, if we've identified these factors, can we inoculate firefighters? Can we get in early during their cadet training or during early on in service, and can we do this? Now, there have been many attempts, mainly in the military, but also in a lot of um, first responder agencies to do this. And let me just sum it up by saying there's very limited evidence that it works. Lots of attempts have tried, but they've typically failed. And the bottom line is, we honestly don't have a good evidence base to really implement this at a, at a policy level. And the fact is, I'm, I've been involved in a bunch of trials, and with budget cuts, and with new technologies, and new equipment, and new uh, steps having to be built into cadet training all the time, to be honest, behavioural health comes down the list of priorities. So the idea that we can honestly do this, I think it's a little bit unrealistic. I do need to speak about the issue of debriefing. I mean, firefighting, thanks to the Jeff Mitchell model, is sort of where a lot of the debriefing started a few decades ago. As many of you will know, studies that have been done, evidence uh, indicating that it does not prevent PTSD. I've just been involved in a, in a meta-analysis of a number of studies just involved with first responders where they've done trials. And that's also indicating that it does not prevent PTSD. Um, but let me quickly follow that up by saying this does not contradict the use of operational debriefing or the use of peers. I think a lot of organisations have mistakenly thrown the baby out with the bathwater on this whole issue. One of the things that I think your organisation does exceptionally well is the use of peers. I think your peers have actually operating at a very, very sensible level, with a very, very sensible framework. Because one of the things we do know without any doubt is that probably the most important thing in the acute phase after a critical incident is your social, your unit support. This is going to be the most healing, the most uh, critical factor and actually being isolated and not having that is, is something that we've just got to always be wary of. But to, to cut a, a long story short, really where the field's at at the moment in this, in this space is that really what we do need to be doing is monitoring those people who need the help. Often people aren't ready to talk in the first few days, but we need systems in place to be able to monitor so we can actually help those people who do need it at some point. What do we know about treatment? Um, essentially, it's very simple. Um, we try to do what we call cognitive behaviour therapy. Very simple, it teaches people to reduce their arousal. It actually gets people to focus on trauma memories and believe it or not, we actually ask them to go over those memories repeatedly. We do this because we know it's like turning the light on with a rat and if you turn it on often long enough without any adverse outcome, the brain learns, I don't have to be scared of that anymore. And that's essentially what therapy is. That's simple. And we also teach people to think more realistically about themselves, about their expectations of themselves and, and future harm. Now, all international guidelines around the world recommend this approach. It's about the only disorder that's superior to any pharmacotherapy. Obviously, the other problems like depression, et cetera, that's where the drugs come in. But PTSD, this approach is definitely the best one. Ironically, and this is phenomenal, is that up to now we actually have no evidence for this for first responders. And given this is the most exposed population on the planet, go figure. Um, but uh, this is just repeating a point I made earlier. We do need to, in therapy, do focus on the comorbid problems. 
I wanted to take a moment to talk about a trial that we've just done in uh, my clinic that I think is the first major trial where we actually took in emergency responders. And just to give you some background, we've been doing trials for many years in my clinic very successfully. I then started one with um, emergency responders with our established protocol. It's a very good protocol. And I tell you, it sucked. Um, for the first time, I had a population that just wasn't responding to our treatment. Um, so we had to regroup and we had to think how do we adapt it for the emergency responders. And it wasn't just firefighters, it was also police and paramedics. And we really needed to build in modules to accommodate the other problems, the alcohol abuse, the depression, the anger. But we also had to build in a lot about just getting these guys trust and getting them to understand that we know the job and that we, we understand the issues about um, fitness for duty and, and all the issues that go along about being a firefighter. You just can't treat them like a civilian. And anyway, we did this trial. It was, everyone got randomised to um, initially one of three conditions. There was 12 weeks of treatment. There was the cognitive behaviour therapy that I just spoke about. And we had two variants of cognitive behaviour therapy that is sort of a side issue here, but they got exposed to 40 minutes of their trauma memory repeatedly or 10 minutes of their trauma memory versus a wait list. And the bottom line is it worked very, very well. And both variants of the cognitive behaviour therapy worked very, very well. So I do think this sort of treatment is going to be very effective in treating PTSD in firefighters, but you've got to be sensitive and you've got to adapt it to the needs of the firefighters population because they do have distinctive needs. And, you know, as an aside, I've really got to applaud this, this centre of excellence that you guys have set up. Um, you do have the opportunity here to, to be actually be tailoring cognitive behaviour therapy for the specific needs of the population. And, you know, we've got evidence now that it does work. Now, the major barrier to care. This is the issue that we've all got to deal with. We've got effective treatments, but we know that most firefighters will not access it. Um, Stigma is a huge issue. Um, and we know, you all know this in terms of just general, in the community, there is a mental health stigma, but also it's, it's threats to promotion, threats to fitness for duty. And also there are barriers caused by your superiors. There's a constant attempt in all organisations to try to move this generational um, perspective um, to reduce the stigma. And really the way to do this, I think, is by training managers. I want to tell you about a trial that I've just been involved in at my university. I didn't lead it, but a colleague did. And I thought it's a very cool trial. And essentially what we did was we worked with New South Wales Fire and Rescue. And we, we just tried to target the managers. And what we did was we initially assessed the sickness absence rates in nearly 2,000 fire and rescue um, firefighters in our state. Now, in this particular state, um, each shift manager, if you like, um, in each firehouse is responsible for supervising 12 to 20 firefighters. Now, what we did was we randomly um, gave half of the managers just a four-hour training in mental health um, care. It was basically just half a day of just what is mental health signs, what do you need to look out for, um, what are your responsibilities as a manager, and basic communication skills. And then subsequently we did um, an independent follow-up to see what happened. And what we found was that the people who were trained, it actually resulted in a significantly reduced sickness absence rates relative to those that weren't. Now that is actually a huge outcome for such a small intervention. We actually did the cost um, effectiveness analysis on this and we found that for every dollar that was spent on the training, US, it was a $14 uh, return. Now, from a business model point of view, that's bloody good. Apart from the mental health benefits. Now, we also um, followed up and looked at how many of these managers actually um, followed up and when they identified a mental health problem, did they actually make contact with the firefighter? And we found again that in the those that received the training, 100% actually then made contact 
with the firefighter who actually then needed help. Again, that's exactly what we want. This is the sort of thing. Now, we're not going to get that sort of uh, effect by just looking at the firefighter. We need to be working with management. So take home messages of all of this. Look, the prevention story may hold some promise. I don't want to shut the door on it, but at the moment, I think inoculation type training, we've got very limited evidence for it. I think the evidence-based interventions, they are critical, and what we've got to make sure is that if there is a firefighter who's not travelling well, make sure they get to the sort of help that they need. I tell you, one of our greatest gripes is that most people providing therapy or counselling for people with post-traumatic stress are doing the wrong thing. That, your, your, your firefighters deserve better. And the fact that I know at the centre of excellence this is the sort of thing you're doing and this is what needs to be promoted. And I know it's hard in regional areas where you don't have you know, the, the, the big um, populations and all the mental health specialists to provide the services. And I know a lot of EAP providers do not provide it. I know this is an ongoing struggle, but we've got to aim for it. I think what your peers are doing is fantastic. I think the social, the unit support is key and will always be the bedrock of what you will then do and of the ongoing monitoring. But rather than thinking about resilience as something that we're going to somehow develop resilience in an individual, I would encourage you to think about it as building a resilient organisation. And that means training the managers, training the fire chiefs, training everybody you know, who are the line managers so they know how to identify the issues and they know how then to react. And finally, I just think in terms of my experience in Australia, is that if we're really going to try to reduce the stigma and push this agenda forward, we never talk about mental health. This is not what it's about. It's about promoting well-being. We talk about a healthy body, healthy mind. And the best way to do it is not to focus just on the individual, but to focus on the unit. Because the one thing we know with firefighters is that what is the most important piece of equipment that you have? It's your buddies. And that's really what we push when it comes to psychological well-being, is you've really got to be able to push looking after each other so that you're not relying on the individual themselves. All right, thank you very much for your attention and thanks for the invitation.